Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special season finale episode of Beauty and the Bear. I'm Nathan Little. And I'm Ms. I'm a Star. And just because we love you all so very much, you're going to get to see the very best bits from the very best interviews. The funniest moments from the hottest guests. And because our producers don't want to give us the money to record another episode. And because our power is about to get shut off. Well, really, this is just going to be a rehash of the same old shit you've seen over the last seven weeks. And a lot of stuff that wasn't good enough for the show in the first place. Enjoy! Enjoy. On this week's episode of Beauty and the Bear, Melbourne's princes of glam punk, the Blow Waves, frock designer Brian North, radio and TV funny man Adam Richard, dance legend Lee Warren, cabaret star Selena Jenkins, radio producer Logan Bold, makeup artiste Aaron Crocker, cabaret character Sarah Ward, and to start the show, former child star and fellow humanitarian Glace Chase. I mean, you have been calling, calling my publicists, well, and I haven't been calling exactly, but you know, our team here at the show has been. Well, I know, and I'm so sorry. I told my publicist to get back to you, but you know, she's a busy person too. Yeah, it yeah. can, you yeah, know. No, she did get back to us. She said F off, but um, you know, <laughs> but we're here, here now, now. <laughs> and I'm so glad. <laughs> so. I am Glace Chase. Yeah. Where does that take you? Well, I guess it's just sort of, you know, a metaphysical journey into my life. And with an audience. With an audience, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't just do it into, like, you know, my bedroom mirror. And that's how I got my Beyonce high notes, you know? The, ah, 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 ah. Did Are you we like still that? running? Yes. No cameras got broken in that instant. Ah! You were a child star. I was seven when my sitcom broke and hit the mainstream. Boy Knows How to Do It. It was a big hit on the cable channels in America. We all know. Television is a tough, tough road. And once you've done it once, you've done it for a lifetime. But, um, you know, yeah, I, I, I think that I'm an entertainer and I like to entertain. And, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out. Wouldn't rule it out. It doesn't have to be a sitcom anymore. You know, with no. the reality television revolution. Well, it didn't really work for Jessica Simpson, though, really. No, but she has really clear skin now, or am I getting confused <laughs> with something else? <laughs> That's it. I oh knew I'd seen her in something. Do you use Proactive? I do not. Oh, you could use SK2. Kate Blanchett swears by it. What in the hell is SK2? Is it SK2? It's, you no, know, it's, it's made with some, like, it's, no, it's, oil. It's, it's Tourette's. It's, it's <laughs> Jamie and I had met through his band Love Outside Andromeda and the Mavises just through we had a musical connection after a, a gig one night and he was playing me my own songs on guitar and we had a bit of a sing along and became friends and he was supportive of what I was doing, I was playing and stuff and bouncing it off him and I was coming off another band and I just didn't know what I was going to do. You pretty, you're a pretty glamorous band. Did, did the look come before or after the music? Did you, did you have an idea of what you wanted to look like, or was that just something that came naturally afterwards? It wasn't even about dressing up or anything in the beginning. We just kind of thought it would be fun and put on some clothes, and it kind of started evolving. You've got a pretty big following now with uh, MySpace and Facebook. How important is uh, social networking? That was another thing from the very first gig. There was people there for some reason. The audience had as much fun as we did, and it was like a party kind of thing. And it happened naturally, and it's yeah, from my experience that if that happens naturally, yeah, keep going. And I know it's hard to do, but how how would you define your sound? John hit on the head with disco punk. I reckon it's pretty spot on. It does the fact that you guys are or aren't queer come into the music at all? It comes into the lyrics and the presentation, but it also uh, 
doesn't, I don't, don't want to be labelled as anything. I kind of want to break labels. Keep that to me. Before the end of the show. Romeo, me I could not have a show starring myself in an interview format without having someone who's an expert in makeup on the show. I mean, what can you tell me right off the bat as, as a girl who wears just a little base mm -hmm. and a little lip gloss? You know, what would you do to sort of jazz me up? I wouldn't touch anything, darling, as stunning as it is. Oh, thank you. You like the natural look, yeah? I do like the natural look. <laughs> <laughs> lip gloss and mascara it goes a long way. Tell me all the glamorous magazines you've worked for. Glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put them into subcategories. Right, okay. I've worked for Woman's Day, Woman's Weekly, New Idea. All the Australian icons. Yeah. Uh, People Magazine, Hustler, Penthouse, Playboy, uh, Darwin City Buzz, of course. <laughs> so you're, you're doing Women's Day and you're doing Hustler. Mmm. What is the difference? Same models. <laughs> <laughs> These publications just have the same models for different magazines. They're really tight. Tight, you say? <laughs> that has got to be in a later time slot, don't you think? The 80s and 90s were such a vibrant, colorful time. How much of your inspiration is still coming from those childhood and teenage experiences? I'm still using it in my creative work now, especially the looks of Pat McGrath, who does all the Dior runway makeup, the performance art legends, Lee Bowery, Boy George, of course. You know, the list is endless, but I'm, I'm constantly drawing on the past for reference, and I think that uh, any good makeup artist that's working um, needs to be able to have that, that reference bank. And they say that, you know, things go in cycles, but for me, having also the 80s be, you know, the real teenage touchstone for me, mm. We're not going around in circles. We keep returning back to the 80s over and over and over again. Absolutely. <laughs> in everything. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you, It's been you, a darling. pleasure. Absolutely. And maybe one day you could brighten me up a little. <gasps> you know, Anna, you're such a comedian. Every time I look at you, I just laugh and laugh and laugh. Well, luckily I have laughs too, Nathan, especially when I remember that time you lost that hand of strip poker and had to run around the block three times naked while the crew slow clapped and I called the RSPCA escaped animal hotline and told them, a monster's loose! I wonder if that footage is ever going to reach the light of day. Why don't you check online at www.beautyandthebear.com.au where you can upload, download, or send us a load so we can forward it on to our laboratory for analysis. Mm, yummy. Serious face. Serious face. Serious face, Nathan. Serious face. Serious face. Serious face. Serious face. Not every story here on Beauty and the Bear can be happiness and sunshine. We have embraced our fair share of very serious stories about coming out. Or losing a partner. About achieving against all odds. Or how little your hair has changed from episode to episode. Serious face! <laughs> Tell me a little bit about how this particular show came about. It really is telling a story I think that is infrequently told in any medium. Um, so, how did it come to be on the radio? It's giving voice to a marginalised community. And, and this then, is women with HIV? Uh, women with HIV, yeah. Uh, HIV positive and affected women. So, mm -hmm. not only women who, who are HIV positive, but women who are carers for people who are HIV positive as well. For me, it's a, a, an amazing collaboration and celebration of the power of community. I'm a woman of 40-something and a mother to my 15-year-old daughter and 21-year-old son, a long-time partner to their dad, and a daughter to my separated parents. I'm also HIV positive and was diagnosed way back in 1987 and given a two-year death sentence. I think a lot of people, especially these days with the you know, proliferation of commercial radio and how much the flavor of radio at the moment is comedians mm. and popular mm. music, yeah. that power that we used to have in radio to be able to tell stories first to tell stories that weren't being told elsewhere mm. has has died off a bit. Mm. How is it, how important is is it to have 
radio stations like Radio Adelaide. In, in, extremely important. I think I really think radio is going to um, make a, a comeback in a sense. And I think not that it ever died because I think if you think how many times but it has wandered off. Mm, we have to it's still, but it's kept up, you know. Like it's it's still linking in with you know online stuff and mm. you can get podcasts and all that stuff. So it's keeping up with the technology. But the beauty of radio and the passion that I have for it is that it leaves so much to the imagination. You know, it, television or uh, visual forms just feed it to you. You know, you've got it all there in front of you. Radio, you listen to something. You know, your imagination's working. You're imagining what they look like. What you know, the, if they're telling a story. You're imagining the story. It's it's a quite, it's a beautiful medium. I'm HIV positive, but my community does not know. It is too scary to take the risk. I hear things in my community, gossip, and stories about people they think are HIV positive. They do not want to shake their hands. They judge them, thinking they must use drugs or be a prostitute. There is much fear and ignorance. One day, I would like all the young liberal men to wake up with a <laughs> for a head. She's everything that I can't say or don't feel comfortable to say. She's super confident. She's super sexy. Um, she's political. I feel like I'm in drag a little bit sometimes mm -hmm. because heels, I find heels quite uncomfortable. Oh, me so, too. Yeah. <laughs> so I think she's different to any other character I've done before, but it's very cathartic because um, she believes she's a diva and well, she knows she is. Mm -hmm. But it's also sad and I think that some people don't see that part of the character that She's, um, she's very vulnerable. Sometimes I find myself alone regretting some, some little thing, some little simple thing I've done. But you know, I'm just a soul whose intentions are why did the feminist cross the road? To get away from you, face! Nick Bond was doing an interview with me for B News and he said to me, so, Yana's bi, why is she bi? And I said, she must be because she must hate everybody. He's like, in, in what way? Well, she's got to have sex with men and women, sex that neither of them give her an orgasm and therefore she hates both of them. So that's kind of... She's kind of, yeah, it's all about sex. Um, and I also do poems about young liberals and about Daryl Summers. And how, and does the, how does the young liberals one go down? Because I heard that you might have had a few mixed. walkouts sometimes. The first one, yeah, the first night was a walkout. Do you think they were liberals? Probably, but I think if you're a liberal you can still laugh. Well, I hope so. And what, and what inspired the young liberal? Uh, I saw a really horrible documentary. Frightened me. It was only about a year after I'd come out and it just kept coming back to the main policies for young liberals was to uh, make sure that homosexuals don't exist. But it's also that horrible, that really boring thing of um, homosexuals. It's like you, they don't even, they don't ever talk about lesbians. It's like lesbians don't exist, you know what I mean? Or attacking gay men. And it's interesting when they get into the debate they'll tend to bring in other things such as well if we allow them to marry then we have to allow horses and dogs to marry and, and, I, and people to marry children. It's like no 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 let's just talk about two females and two males. And it's like um, if you can't see the difference between two men being in love and a man being in love with a child you're the one with the problem. Exactly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like why are they spending so much time Obsessing over it. That's about right. About us fucking. That's right. Because I tell you what, it's the last thing I want to think about is them having dry missionary style sex. And I want to think about their ugly bed covers. No. <laughs> <laughs> their decor. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Disgusting. <laughs> Brenda and It's All About Me, which is your first cabaret show, um, was a sort of distillation of your real life put through a, a very exotic prism. Was that difficult? Not really. It was very interesting because I, for some, I don't know why I wanted to write a show. I just sort of, I thought, well, I've got to do it. And I started, I was going to write about all the people I'd met in my life in London and who I'd seen on stage in New York and things like that. 
and then it sort of when you're right it actually it's like a tree and it actually branches out and you take a different root and branch or whatever and and the story changes and it so happened that it sort of I became began to tell the story of my life. And did you always imagine that Brenda would be the one telling the story? I was actually going to do, or Brenda was going to do the story, yes, um, because I wouldn't have ever told my own story, most definitely. I, I did an interview once um, and <clears throat> it was um, a photograph of Brenda and that was, and uh, what was really sad about it, I actually did the interview and the photograph of Brenda was like um, me hiding because of being HIV positive. So I actually um, didn't want any discrimination with the general public and stuff like that. So with that, I could actually tell the story even mostly stronger and more to the point than I could do if it was a photograph of me. The HIV thing is interesting for me because I started my career at a time when a bit like beauty queens and, and how they have to have um, a mission. You know how Miss Universe has a mission mm -hmm. and she has a chosen charity. When I was young, HIV was every drag queen's charity. Mm -hmm. As in we were united in a mission. If you're gonna go home with somebody, make sure you wear a rubber, as you know, at the end of the show. Yeah. Um, do you think it's a reflection of the heat going off the issue as a culture? Most definitely. Do you think that's the best way of addressing it in terms of shows or? I think any way, any way, whatever way you can actually address the issue, I think, you know, whether it's you're up on stage in a frock or, you know, you're sitting here, we're talking about it, you're talking to me about it right now. If you think it's confronting to talk about having HIV and AIDS, talking about having a partner who's died of it, considering the hundreds of thousands of people around the world who've experienced the same thing, I think that's very courageous and I applaud you for it. Thank you. But how do you get to a point where you can talk about that on stage or, uh, you know, or talk about it here? Well, I don't know. It's just he in himself was very open and very bold and would speak about anything. And I'm quite fortunate to have carried his legacy on. And he's made me bold and very outspoken and sometimes too outspoken. <laughs> don't night, don't fight, have a piece of food, have a piece of food. Oh, is this series over yet? I just want to die! I'm so tired! I'm completely out of segues, I'm... <laughs> Make your own way the commercial break, you sons of bitches! <laughs> Nathan and I will be forever grateful to the producers of Beauty and the Bear for reminding us that we're contractually obligated to maintain a certain persona when on air. And in the spirit of that firm honesty, Nathan, do you think you'd be able to hold it together for, I don't know, another 30 seconds? I'm willing to try. Super duper. Okay, so in the last package of the last episode of the very first season of Beauty and the Bear, a quick reminder that this show isn't just about interviews, it's also about Art. Hello everybody, I'm Ms. I'm a Star and I'm here with Lee Warren, famed choreographer. Feel happy with the title famed choreographer? Mm, it'll do, it'll do, it'll do. <laughs> Infamous would be better. One of the things I find interesting about you is that you, you did have a, a quite a substantial dancing career. N you know, not every dancer becomes a choreographer and, uh, and a lot of them I think moved to choreography quite quickly, but you had a very substantial career. Yeah, it was 14 years, I suppose, in Europe and America and, um, and UK. So yes, it was. But I think it takes virtually your first 10 years to begin to pick up all the, the stagecraft and, and, and really how things are put together. Um, it's the way our legacy in our particular art form progresses. And it's essential that, that performers have more than one source of, of uh, a, you know, one, more than one choreographer. So they can reflect on what those differences are. But it's also your connect, once you've worked with a choreographer, you're connected to that lineage and that when you've made work, it's imprinted on your body. You know, it's there forever because you've, you've physicalized something that was an idea and you've memorized it in, in literally in space and time. 
so that you can retouch it and bring it back if you want to uh, at any time. And that's how the encoding process uh, happens with dancers. And the diversity of that process is really, really important for future development. What was it that first inspired you to become a dancer? To, to, did you actually think to yourself, I want to pursue that career? How did it actually happen? I think it was actually my first drag number. I rem the earliest dancing thing I remember is my, my grandmother um, lived quite a long time. My father was born in Fiji. Um, so there was this wonderful grass skirt that my grandmother had and she used to sing these Polynesian songs to me as a kid. And I must have been about seven or so and, and I think I've got this picture of me with this grass skirt tied around my neck with the arms out trying to hold it up and she's singing and I'm kind of going... <laughs> <laughs> and you can see the picture. I'm gyro and I've, I've got this clear memory of this at my grandmother's house with her singing and me kind of doing a little kind of Watusi number on the back lawn. Um, that's my first, first memory of dancing. And I've, um, I'm told by my parents, I, I don't know if it's true, but the, the, the minute I would hear music, I would rip my clothes off and start dancing. And this occurred... And some people would say <laughs> nothing's changed. <laughs> Gretel Colleen calls him a cockroach. Darren Hayes calls him a <laughs> But I call him the fabulous Adam Richard. How are you doing, Adam? I'm good. Are you allowed to say that? For sure, allowed. Oh, my God, yay! Channel 31, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> You really did say that. Who's, who's some of the people that you pissed off? You know, was, was Darren uh, Hayes, was he really that he, No, he was quite funny, like, because I used to read out his diaries on mm -hmm. Triple J. Yeah, I, used, I loved <laughs> and, um, and I loved the I loved the little mincy voice. <laughs> as well. I know, Darren did stuff like that when I did his voice, which he does now. Which um, made every time you <laughs> mentioned Kylie Minogue such more... <laughs> oh my God, I love Kylie. I love Kylie. Um, but yeah, Darren was, you know, I mean, he's obviously come out now, but he was in the closet then mm -hmm. um, with, you know, <laughs> the closet with glass doors on it. Mm -hmm. uh, we could all see him in there. But yeah, he, he was really sweet because I said, oh, look, you know, I have to confess, I'm the guy that used to read out your diaries. He went, oh, you're the mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So it was kind of funny about it, but yeah. Have you had the tables <laughs> turn? Are you, are you cropping up in, um, you know, gossip <laughs> mags? Are you getting, you know, things said about you? Um, uh, do you know what? Because it's kind of like a little clutch of, you know, we all kind of hang out together. So mm -hmm. someone from the confidential did email me and say, you know, in the in the Herald Sun, the Melbourne one, said, oh, look, someone's just sent this into us. Hilarious. Did you do this? And I was Is like... Is it true you're topping out? Yeah. <laughs> I think I'd bottom Anthony clear, but I think you can fit him all in. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like he's so shiny. Luke, that's ready to go. <laughs> I hope he says his prayer before. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tim. I, I can't mean that. <laughs> Now before Nathan and I pull on our cha-cha heels and dance the hell out of here, we'd like to say a very big thank you to the producers, directors, writers, and crew here on Beauty and the Bear. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you to the Australian Community Television Networks for giving us our start. And to all the artists who came on the show this year, thank you for allowing us into your life and your arts practice. And of course the sponsors of Beauty and the Bear, which you can find at www.beautyandthebear.com.au. Wow, Nathan, what's that I hear? <gasps> the the real. Good night. Gee, Ima, I'd love to do a duet with Justin. Me too. What do you want to sing? I'm not talking about singing. And after the break, legendary... <laughs> That's sick shit. <laughs> okay. Like an over-caffeinated, armless chimpanzee behind a drum kit. <laughs> <laughs> and you're back with Beauty and the Bear. Ima, do you hear what I hear? The voices in my head telling me to turn your creamy skin into a dress? <laughs> 
Don't hit eject, my cock comes out. Egg just fell out of my ass. Born in Italy. I love you. I love you.